Hey everybody, welcome to DTL today. DTLT today. I am Martha Burtis. This is Jim Groom. Uh, you all know that. Yeah. We're going to try and um, make up for yesterday's broadcast. Yeah, which went off the rails. Tim and I weren't in the office, and that's what happens when Tim and I aren't here to, to keep everything under control. Me and Andy were making it was, art. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was unplanned art. Um, today we have something much more substantive. Some would say, yes. Some would say. We're going to be joined in a minute by a former Mary Washington student, Lauren Orsini, Ooh. who was an English major here at Mary Washington and is now a journalist with The Daily Dot at daily.com, dot, dot, daily um, where she covers, um, in particular, um, happenings on the web, uh, she's got, I think, a real interest in fan culture and in anime. She has a master's degree in journalism from American. She also is an adjunct instructor at American. That's right, I saw she that. Teaches, she teaches uh, web, web design stuff. And um, she has also dabbled in infographics in the past in a previous position as well as currently at the Daily Dot. And one of the things that spurred us to bring her on was this incident in Kansas involving the high schooler who criticized um, Governor Brownback. It's Brownback, right? Yeah, in Kansas, yeah. yeah. And um, Lauren wrote about that incident. She's written a couple articles for the Daily Dot about what's happened, and the governor finally apologized this morning. Um, so we're going to ask her a little bit about that. But the other interesting thing I, me I meant to mention this is how Lauren came on my radar at all this fall was that back in September, around September 11th, I was reading an article, I think, I think it was on Slate or Salon, that was a series of essays um, from folks looking 10 years back and I was reading this article and it was by Lauren and it was just completely coincidence and I recognized the name and sure enough it was it was Lauren Orsini and so um, I've been following her on Twitter since then but you you know Lauren from back when she was a student yeah I know Lauren when she did her literary journal with uh, uh, she was in literary Professor journals. Emerson's literary journal class but Lauren has been doing this stuff you know alongside UMW but I love Lauren I've been following on Twitter because for me, she's a great example of how social media and what the stuff we've been trying to do at UMW, she's been turning into what a career when, and quite successfully, leave. I well, think. And, so. and that's kind of a theme for today because you're going to be – we have a, a twofer today. There's also going to be some former DS106 students visiting later this afternoon. And so t today is all about UMW students. What, we, what we have given these students. Yeah, exactly. The great gift. So please reinforce that. <laughs> so let's bring Lauren in. She's on Skype with us now. Great. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Hello. How are you Good. doing? We're doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Jim's left. I didn't really <laughs> you found out about me from um, my September 11th. Now, course. was that on Salon or Slate? It was on Forbes. It was on Forbes. I don't know why I thought it was the others. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about? Were you asked to write that, or was that something you had written for another purpose and they picked up? Or? I, I, was asked, I, I was asked yeah. to write that. Um, I've known um, Susanna Breslin since Oh, great. June. She changed my life, in fact. Great. That was great. It was a wonderful it's, piece. Yeah. Before... So it's an interesting story, yeah. actually, if you want to hear so it. So let me ask you, Lauren, to get this started. So you graduate from UMW. You go to American University. You study journalism. What's been your past since graduating in terms of social media and jobs? Give us an idea of that. Social media... Social media is how I got a job. Um, last year, okay, this is, it's at the end of November. This time last year, I was working at a gym. I was a cashier. And um, actually, it was in October that I was really having trouble with the cash register. You know, it's a bad job market. So this is the job I, I could get. So it's the job I worked. And I was having trouble with the, ca with the cash register. It was taking forever. And this guy, this, this muscle head says to me while I'm ringing up his energy drink, no wonder you're a cashier. <gasps> I couldn't believe it. And oh my God! I said, you know what I'm gonna do? 
I'm going to get a job this month. I'm going to get a job in the next 30 days. So I started a Tumblr. All my friends were doing this thing called NaNoWriMo. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've heard of that? National Novel yeah. Writing Month. So I made uh, something called NaNoJobMo, um, which if you spell that out, it doesn't really mean anything. But I said, every day I'm going to apply for one job for 30 days. And I did that. Sure. And um, I ended up getting um, seven interviews. Wow. So that, that definitely worked out. And... Um, like, while I was going, I would make infographics about my um, successes and failures and how many people I applied to and my success rate, which turned out to be one in every six um, resumes, um, actually went to somebody. So, I mean, if you're having a hard time looking for a job, that's you got to just keep Multiples applying. of sex. <laughs> yeah, it was... Yeah, so I use Tumblr for that. So now, were you when I you were documenting this on Tumblr, were you talking about the jobs you were applying for? Yeah. Yeah, and I was talking about life as a person who is underemployed. Right. I was talking about I'm trying to get health care, but going to a free health clinic instead. I just kind of made it completely public. And people started um, following it and passing my resume around for me. Eventually, that's what got me um, the job I ended up getting at at Pew. My uh, boss said, I just really like that you, you were making infographics in your free time. <laughs> it means you'll probably do them while you're working here, too. So, so when, in terms of the infographics, was that something that you had done any of while you were here at Mary Washington when you were working yeah. at, you worked on the bullet, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. So, so and, what kind of uh, got you into the yeah, whole the infographic like writing style? You always, think you're you always think you're you always think you're a good writer if you like. I don't know. I always, I got a writing award in high school, so I thought I was pretty great. <laughs> and then when I started working for the Bullet, and my stories were getting edited over and over, and it was it was a really good push into reality to figure out what I need to do to improve. Now I know some people have said that you know you know journalism is an incredibly fraught field right now with the emergence of new media and how mainstream media has in some cases failed to figure out how to survive. And one of the things I've heard is that one of the like actual burgeoning um, parts of journalism is infographics and that there's a lot of places that are finally sort of like investing money and hiring people into those um, kinds of positions. Is that something that you're seeing as a professional working in the field? I'm definitely seeing that. I mean, have you noticed on, like, the Gawker blogs, they'll just slap up an infographic and write a few words about it. Yeah. And the infographics are going viral yeah. now. On my Pinterest, um, I mean, if anyone uses Pinterest, I have a, a pin board that's just infographics, and all these strangers are following it. It's my most followed um, board. Really? It, people are, are loving these. It's, a, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. It's an infographics work. 10 right. million. It's got the data in there, it's too. It's interesting that you bring up Pinterest, because me and my wife were just looking at that the other night, and I like that site a lot. I've never it's seen it. It's still invite-only, but um, yeah. it's something worth looking, because it's kind of like a delicious, but it's visual. Mm. So you pin it on a board. That's cool. And you cool. can see everything someone else is looking at, and kind of brings those things up. Now, Lauren, we have your Occupy Wall Street infographic up, and one of the things that's interesting is you're talking about, I got my job through Tumblr, talking about how I don't have a job and I'm underemployed. Sounds like you're part of the 99%, and on top of that, you went and made an infographic here, so we have it up. Anything you want to say about your Occupy Wall Street infographic? Uh, that was kind of a joke. We just it, it started as an inside joke in the office, and we're, by the way, my office is right here in my living room. It's We're all located all over um, the country, so we sit around in a chat room all day. And we were joking about, like, wow, everyone is playing, a, uh, every band is playing at Occupy Wall Street. Who's going to be next? Who isn't going to be yeah. next? So we decided to turn it into a um, infographic. So that's cool. And uh, I don't have the stats right now about how popular it was, but people seem to get a good laugh from it. So tell, tell, us, tell really? us a little bit about The Daily Dot. Mm -hmm. The Daily Dot is, um, well, what we're trying to do is be... Um, the community newspaper of the World Wide Web. Instead of talking about tech news, we talk about people. Um, I prefer to focus on communities of obsession because that's actually what my boss calls my beat, which is, I think, a creepy way of saying fan, fan culture. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Communities yeah, of obsession. obsession. That's right. 
Yeah, I mean, I've always been obsessed with this stuff. Um, so when, like, so the Hunger Games movie came out, and, I mean, it didn't come out yet, but, you know, the first trailer came out. So then they started doing this amazing viral campaign on Twitter. So um, I got assigned that to write about that. And I, I started noticing, wow, they have a different Twitter account for every district. They have a Facebook page. for They, they have 12 different Facebook pages just for this one movie. They must be paying a lot of people so much. No. No. They were all teenagers. They're all fans who just love the Hunger Games. They were working for wow. free. And that kind of stuff fascinates me. Yeah, it's funny. I love that you're saying that because another way to talk about fan fiction or these communities' obsession um, and I taught uh, this DS-106 class, and one of the things we got into and talked a lot about was some people mm -hmm. call it fan fiction, but a lot of theorists call it fan labor. Yeah. And it's the idea of all this labor for free that people do because they're obsessed with it and how the Internet has kind of provided a cr crazy new market yeah. for viral marketing that's completely cheap. And in a, and it's it's an incredibly tense relationship yeah. between you know the producers of that media and the fans. And I know there have been incidents. I remember we talked about this in DS One Hundred Six in the spring, where like maybe five or six years ago, one of the um, studios decided to put up a website that was going to be this like fan fiction repository, and it was supposedly because they believed in the fans and they wanted fans to contribute and have a, a good place where they could kind of build community and share. And then it turned out that whenever you contributed it, contributed to this site, you had to give up your copyright. Uh. And so it really was that they were trying to sort of subvert, um, the, you know, the labor of fans to generate more sort of capital for themselves. That's right. And but then and then you have a model like you're talking about with the Hunger Games, where they're not necessarily monetizing. Well, they are, but not directly monetizing that labor. But, you know, how do you feel about that? What do you think the line is there in terms of, you know, production of, of yeah. intellectual capital like that by fans? And like they said, the obsession stuff is huge, but is it exploitation yeah. at some point? You know, exploitating of someone else's obsession. Hmm. I mean, it was definitely surprising yeah. um, when I found out that these are these are teenagers. The youngest one is 14, and she says that she just hasn't wanted to go to school lately because she just wants to do Hunger Games <laughs> marketing. That's insane. And they all told me they were going to get a free uniform, but nobody's seen it, so they're not sure. And it's very mysterious. Right. And they seem to... Uh, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I'm not one to talk about working for free because I spend my entire year volunteering for Anime USA, which is um, an anime convention in Washington, D.C., where... Um, I, I send out a monthly press release. I um, accept and monitor press applicants. At the convention, I mean, I don't get to have fun. I just hang out with the press people and supervise the interviews. And I, and I do all this for free because I love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, but I see that you need to have a line. Well, there's the other point that you're bringing up, and I think it's a good one, is at what point, and I don't mean everything has to be for personal gain, but right. by being obsessed and by loving it, I think that opens up new avenues that other people will sure. ultimately... I mean, there's the whole idea of the gift economy or the indirect nature of how money works on the web. Right. You know, you're blogging for free about your work and what you do and how you're not working actually got you a job. So there's that weird kind of right. thing we haven't quite figured out. So. Well, and at the same time, I imagine there are times when you feel like, so you do that work for, for, the, conven for the anime conventions as volunteer, but there must be times when, given the beat that you have at the Daily Dot and how much it resonates with you personally, you must think, oh my God, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and you know, even though I work for free, I do get some perks. Like, I mean, because I have to deal with all the press, I mean, I, now I have press contacts with the Huffington Post and the Washington City yeah. Paper, right. and I, I use those for my right. actual work. That's right. Right. It's really interesting. That makes tons of sense. So let's talk. We've got a few minutes left. Let's talk a little bit about this incident in Kansas. Yeah. Yeah, what's going on with this? Yeah, what you do you wanna... make about the you governor, do... the teenager, the whole thing? It's crazy. Set up the story for yeah. us, and then give us your read on it. All right. So as I understand it, Emma Kate 988 who is an 18-year-old um, high schooler in Cam Kansas, was, she was on a field trip, and she saw Governor Brownback speak, and she, she hated it. In fact, she wanted to go up and tell him he sucks. <laughs> so, but she, she didn't do that. She just wrote as if she had done it, as kind of like an inside joke. 
she only had 65 followers so she wrote so i like just told told governor brown back he sucks in person hashtag he blows a lot she didn't actually do it it was just a joke um so so brownbacks i guess his people were monitoring twitter so um the next day emma found herself in the principal's office for over an hour and they were telling her how she had to write a written apology and there were people here from the governor's office and um she had she had to write she i guess she hurt his feelings it's it's shocking because i i don't know why they went after emma in the first place if you look at Emma's previous tweets from earlier that day, um, well, that evening she had been having a Twilight Marathon with her friends, and then the day before she had um, just been finding out new information about the Justin Bieber Christmas album and talking about how much she has Bieber fever. So, I mean, she's really a threat to the government, you, as you can see. So Brownback went after her. She, um, she was given the whole Thanksgiving break. Um, she told me to decide if she was what she was going to do, so she just kind of delayed. And uh, while she delayed, things started changing. She she got 7,000 followers from 65, all supporters. Boing Boing wrote about her. Kansas newspapers wrote about her. Um, she's, instead of quoting um, Twilight and Justin Bieber, she started quoting Gandhi. <laughs> I mean, she really grew up a lot. That's awesome. And um, so, so um, yesterday morning, she said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to, not going to apologize. So I, I emailed her. She, she's been emailing a lot lately because she hasn't been at school. So I heard back from her right away, and she's like, my dad's going to school right now. We're going to see what the school says. And yesterday afternoon, school and Governor Brownback both backed down. They said, just kidding. And in fact, we owe you an apology because free speech is important and my staff messed up. Yeah. And she's up to, I checked right before we went on, and she had like 15,001 followers, I think, this afternoon, so. Did you, did you check how many Brownback has? Less than Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It's unbelievable. Well, and what a misstep in terms of calling attention. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean... That's what's really interesting. Yeah, we actually write about this in the Daily Dot a lot when we're writing about people. It's called the Streisand effect, or the Barbara Streisand effect. Have you guys, are you Absolutely guys familiar not. with it? No. I love it. Well, what I is love it? The, line, the title. Tell me more. Well, in, in um, I think it was 2000 or 2001, Barbara Streisand discovered that Google Maps would show you right where her home was. So she started telling people, hey, we got to take this down. By doing so, millions of people who did not even care or know where Barbara Streisand's home was, suddenly knew exactly where it was, <laughs> were pointing it out, were spreading it around the internet, awesome. and now it is common knowledge <laughs> where Barbara Streisand's home is. Wow. Same thing happened to Tom Cruise. Um, we gotta suppress this stuff um, about what people are saying. So the Scientology, the Church of Scientology had to suppress all this stuff about Tom Cruise being crazy. Now, what's the first word you think of when you hear Tom Cruise's right. name? Yeah. A good yeah. point too. So that's exactly what Brownback did good, here. Oh my goodness, sixty-five people might have seen what this um, woman has written, and I mean she is a woman. She's eighteen. She's eligible yeah. to Absolutely. vote. Well, we we better suppress this yeah. right away. I love that, and I love also the idea that back. a complete misunderstanding of how social media works and how connections work in this format really could blow up, and it has blown up in this governor's face. So he looks like completely out of touch. This is the constituency every politician wants to appeal to, be relevant to. It's probably why his feelings were hurt. I mean, but this is for me, I mean, not to bring this back to some pedantic point, is why it's so essential that we start thinking critically about social media. I mean, and thinking critically about the very things you're talking about, like cultures of obsession, um, fan fiction, the kind of idea of fan labor and what that means for the growing market around entertainment that is constantly infusing who we are as a culture, for better or for worse. But I'm actually very interested in this notion, and we at Mary Washington, as you know, Lauren, have been kind of framing social media as part and parcel of what we do here. Um, and let me bring it back to you. Has that at all informed your career as you moved on? Anything you've done here at Mary Washington in terms of social media, in terms of you and your blog, stuff like that, just to kind of hook the bait? Uh, it's definitely, um, it's, it's definitely affected my entire blogging direction. I always use WordPress. Now that I'm a teacher, I tell my students to use WordPress. You rock. Um, 
sometimes I go into classes and I help people set up their WordPress <laughs> blogs. When people ask me what kind of blog to have, wordpress.org, not .com. Yeah. Show them how to use the editor. Always. We won. Yeah. Uh, that, so at least on blogging platforms, we're up. What about though? What about actually the you know the critical interrogation of these landscapes, the usage of the social media? I mean, is that something that you already had, or is that something that you think that university, whether American or UMW or whatever, helps you kind of critically understand better, or is that something that you think most college students are doing independently of their degrees? Yeah, is it something that you had to do despite what you were learning in the classroom, yeah. or do you feel like it was something that was really um, fostered by the institutions. Hmm. Well, it's it's hard for me to say because when I was at Mary Washington, I, I wasn't even on Twitter. I didn't join until 2009, and I thought it was a pretty early adopter. Yeah. Um, huh. I mean, I never thought about blogging before college. Well, well no, that's not true. Because I, I had I had a really crappy blog. You were like Zang um, on Peta's which doesn't even exist anymore. Which one? But. PETAs.com. Uh-huh. And it, it was different then because I didn't blog because of, I didn't think, put any thought into what I'd write on my blog. I would usually write one sentence post and every week I would just recode it because <laughs> I got sick of how it looked. And um, at, at um, Mary Washington, I thought more about the substance and less about the look because now you don't have to recode everything. Yeah. Like, if I wanted, like, back then when I was 13, if I wanted my blog to say that I wrote it on November 29th, I had to manually write in November 29th, <laughs> 2001. How archaic. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so what advice do you have? Mm-hmm. So if for other students out there who are watching this, you're a graduate, UMW. They're about um, to graduate into this horrible job market. That you went to a master's degree. You know, you're kind of, you know, up on up. You're on your way to become the other 1%. So, you know, what would you say? You know, I was accused of being the 1% during an interview with the 99% in D.C. They said, I asked what they were there for, and they said, if you don't know, you're the 1%. Okay, <laughs> people who are about to graduate into this horrible job market, you're you're probably not going to get a job right away. I had a, I had a graduate degree, and it still took me um, four months after that. And this is when it's okay to work for free, but do it under your own terms. I, I mean, I think the reason it was so hard for me to get a job is because the job I wanted as a professional fandom reporter, that didn't exist yet. So I made a blog where I reported about fandom for myself. And to stay sharp, I gave myself assignments. And I gave myself infographics to do because I wanted to do that because I wanted to do that for a living. I mean, so, so pick something you want to do. And make a blog about it. I mean, if it's if it's movies, I'm, I mean, if it's not writing, you you can do video blogging to show it, or um, you can you can do a podcast too. I mean, writing just made the most sense for me. But I think you sh- you should work for free on your own terms, and you probably won't make any money off your blog. I made eleven dollars in two years, <laughs> but I also got a job. That's awesome. great. I love that advice, you know. I think it's solid. Practice your art until and, you get the job. And yeah. do it on your own terms. Yeah. It's awesome. Well, Lauren, thanks Thank for being you. with us today. It was a great show. It's been show. great. And thanks for coming on UMW Zone. We'd love to see a success story. So keep it up. Come visit next time you're in town. We might have her. Maybe we'll have her as our field reporter. Bring her on every so often to DTLT yeah, Today yeah. as our field reporter. What's going on? What are the kids doing out in the internet? <laughs> that would be awesome. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely have had to keep up with the Jersey Shore and Justin Bieber. Because you of have my no job. choice. So, awesome. Yeah, I'll tell you what the kids are we doing. We should have like a meme Probably report or like a viral it. report right. or like infographic of the week and bring you on. <laughs> that would be awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. I'll look forward to coming down to yep. Fredericksburg. You got it. All right. That's it for DTLT That's it for today. D- we have another today. show coming up at 4. Yeah, what time in half an hour. It's 3.30. It's 3.30. So at 4 o'clock, tune back in. DTLT today. We had Lauren Orsini. Next, we're going to have uh, Callie Four Beach and Mr. Thimble talking DS106 six months out. Right. DS106 to life. No. Where are we? DTLT today. DTLT <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you.